Why Coca-Cola Invented Fanta in Nazi Germany We are all familiar with Fanta. Loved by people all over the world, its vibrant orange color is very hard to miss when you are passing through the drink aisle in your local supermarket. No wonder it is one of the most popular drinks in the world. But did you know that Fanta was invented in Nazi Germany? Today we will be talking about why Coca-Cola invented Fanta in Nazi Germany. You must be wondering, Coca-Cola is an American company, how is it possible that it was invented in Nazi Germany, which was an open enemy of the United States? But that's not all. Did you know that initially the drink was produced from food scraps? Well, stick around to the end as we answer these questions and more, and delve into the story of Fanta. Without any further ado, let's go! Before we actually talk about the fact that Fanta was invented in Nazi Germany, I want to give you a little backstory to this whole scenario. That way you're better placed to understand what exactly happened and how that led to Fanta being produced in Germany. It all started in 1923. This was the year when Robert Woodruff was elected as president of the Coca-Cola company. Robert was not like any of his predecessors, as he was highly ambitious and aimed to expand the Coke brand throughout the world. Coke was doing amazing in the United States, yes, but it lacked the same amount of quality and popularity in the rest of the world. The issue laid in the fact that Coke would just lease off their rights to franchises and other companies and supplied them with the Coke formula. This might have helped them at the start to spread the brand of Coca-Cola worldwide, but it also resulted in a huge lapse in quality. For example, in France due to unhealthy bottling practices, many Coke consumers got sick. This really hurt the brand's image. Robert understood this problem and sought to correct the issue. And that is why the Coca-Cola Foreign Department was set up. The point of this department was to set up official plants that would oversee bottling, directly managed by Coca-Cola themselves. This move was quite successful as Coke managed to set up plants in over 27 countries worldwide. This not only ensured that the quality of the product would be perfect and sanitary, but it also meant that Coke would receive a much larger chunk of the revenue generated per bottle, since the bottling was directly managed by them. They didn't stop there, as they also sponsored the 1928 Summer Olympics, resulting in a lot of publicity. Because of this widespread advertising and the setting up of official bottling plants, the quality of the product got better and better and Coke's reputation rose throughout the world. And this is where Germany comes into play. With the Coke boom that occurred all over the world at the time, a German subsidiary for Coke was also set up. An American expat by the name of Ray Rivington Powers was put in charge of the plant. He was an amazing salesman and soon made Germany one of the biggest consumers of Coke, with around 100,000 cases of Coke sold in a year. But on the other end of things, he was also very bad at financial management. That's why the German subsidiary was a financial mess and needed some serious accounts-related help. Unfortunately, before that issue could be addressed, Adolf Hitler rose to power. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Adolf Hitler, so I won't talk about him. But when the reign of the Third Reich began, a German-born man by the name of Max Keith took charge of the German Coke subsidiary. Max was also highly ambitious and was a born leader. He made it his personal mission to save the German subsidiary and sort out their accounting issues. He also changed the marketing strategy, as he knew there would be some enmity between the Germans and the Americans. If he targeted people with an American brand, he wouldn't get that many sales. And so he targeted the masses in Germany by portraying Coke as a brand fit for German consumption. So the big question is, how did he do it? Well, first of all, he sponsored Coke in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. And at those Olympics, the Coca-Cola logo was branded everywhere, but mostly along with the swastika logo. This became a big trend. And unfortunately, you could continue to see the Coke brand alongside Hitler. For example, the Coke logo could be found on the trucks in Hitler youth rallies and could be found near swastika signs all over the country. The unfortunate cherry on top was in the 9th annual concessionaire convention, where Max pledged that he would march Coke to success and then followed it up with a Sieg Heil to Adolf Hitler. I'm sure you can see a trend here. Essentially, Max tried to put Coke alongside the Nazi party, and he knew that would boost sales. 
he knew that he had to make Coke openly support the Nazis. Only then would the public buy this product. And he was successful too, as drink sales began to grow. Though now history would look unfavorably at this union, and rightfully so, Coke began to thrive in Germany. I know folks, you are all waiting for Fanta, and we're almost there. Well, things took a turn for the worse for Coke in Germany when the United States and Coke became enemies at war. As you can imagine, any sort of import or export between the two countries stopped. And as a result, the connection between Max and Robert was broken, and Max was left with no raw material to continue the production of Coke. It became almost certain that the German subsidiary would soon die out. But this is Max Keith we're talking about. He wasn't going to give up so easily. He had managed to bring Coke back to the top when they were a financial mess in Germany, and he could do it again too. This time, the situation was even worse, as there were no raw materials and the markets were also closed down in Germany because of the emergency of World War II. Still, Max didn't give up. He made up an entirely new formula that he could sell to keep the company afloat. He had chemists whip up a formula that was somewhat similar to Coke but with a different taste. And since they didn't have the 7x Coke flavoring, Max used the leftovers of other food industries. Yes, I know that's a little unhygienic, but Max had limited options and went on with what he had. He, along with his team, came up with the name Fanta, based on the word fantasy, as it was a fantasy behind the creation of the drink, given the tough times. Well, Fanta became incredibly successful, and since sugar was in short supply in the country, people started to use Fanta as a source of sugar. Even though the drink had a weird color, people liked the taste, and since there was no other direct competitor available, sales soared. Max then used his connections to get a hold of all of the Coke subsidiaries in all of the Nazi-occupied territories. He introduced Fanta there too. Fanta became a big name in Europe. This went on until the Allies won and seized the Nazi-captured areas after which the production of Fanta also stopped. But Max, being a loyal servant, gave back the profits he made to the headquarters of Coca-Cola in the United States. And now you know how Fanta came into being in Nazi Germany. It was mostly due to the efforts of one man, Max Keith. Later on, Fanta was introduced in Italy in 1955 as a vibrant orange-colored drink made from citrus fruits. Since then, Coca-Cola has continued to sell Fanta and it is now one of their best sellers. Quite some story, from being sold in Nazi Germany as an emergency drink just to keep a subsidiary running, to something that is sold worldwide and is one of the company's best sellers. Out of all of the drinks on the market, Fanta surely has the best story. And on that note, I'll end this video here. Do let me know what you think in the comments down below about the reasoning behind why Coca-Cola invented Fanta in Nazi Germany. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, let us know by giving it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'll see you on the next one.